subsequent to report subsequent to um, subsequent to recording this event, uh, the the um, the taping of it will be put up on the NELC website. Uh, so just so everybody's aware of the fact that we are recording. Okay. And having said that, uh, I'm just going to make a few quick introductions and then uh, hand over the floor. So my, good evening, and my name is Holly Schisler. I am a faculty member in the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilization, Civilizations, and it is my great pleasure this evening uh, to be able to welcome you to another one of the uh, Dumanian uh, lecture series that we um, sponsor every year here at the University of Chicago. I want to, uh, first of all, give particular thanks to uh, Mrs. Dumanian, Mrs. Edna Dumanian and the Dumanian family for their continuing support of the Armenian um, Studies Visiting Professorship and of these lectures uh, that uh, they are generous enough to help underwrite each year. Um, and I also want to call to your attention that there will be uh, another event coming up soon, in case any of you are interested. And that is to say that on May the 6th, also at 6 p.m., uh, we're going to have another Armenian Studies program entitled Towards an Armenian Futurism. And this will feature uh, the filmmaker and writer Kami Abrahamian, uh, and that will be followed by comments by Mashinka uh, Firunz Hagopian and Harang Vartanian. And uh, so we hope very much that you'll be able to join us for that event as well, because I think it's going to be fabulous. Uh, and having said that, I would like to turn over the floor to Professor Ripsame Harutunian, who is really the heart and soul of all things Armenian here at the University of Chicago and certainly in our department to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Holly. Um, hi. Um, so today we are so much uh, fortunate to have our speaker, Sylvia Alajaji, who is currently in residence at the University of Chicago um, as a um, Dumanian visiting professor in Armenian studies. Um, uh, professor Alajaji is an associate professor of music at Franklin and Marshall College, where she also teaches in the international studies program. She is the author of Music in the Armenian Diaspora, Searching for Home in Exile, a multi-sided work that examines the construction of diasporic Armenian subjectivity in the years uh, starting um, uh, the time of the Armenian Genocide, 1915. This work was recently published in, in Turkish as well, in Turkish translation. Her published work uh, centers on the relationship between music and exilic or exilic identity um, for um, uh, primarily um, on Armenian diasporic community uh, focusing primarily uh, on the diasporic Armenian communities in Lebanon and the United States. Um, so without further ado, I will um, hand over the floor to Silvia Alajaji. Ali, do you need to say something? You know, I there was one thing that I meant to add, and I apologize for speaking out of order, but I did want to say, uh, as to format, that after Professor Ali Jaji is finished with her presentation, we'll be taking questions. But we're going to be taking questions exclusively by having you write your questions down in the chat section. And then one of us will read them aloud, and then Professor Ali Jaji will respond. And I'm sorry, I forgot to say that earlier. And now, the star of the show. <laughs> Thank you so much. So I'm going to ask for a little bit of patience while I transfer everything to my screen. So just one second while I figure this all out. Okay, so Holly or Haripsime, if anything is unclear or you can't hear anything when I play music, please just like gesticulate wildly and I'll, and I'll try to fix it. You're good, um, right? 
<laughs> well, um, so thank you so much to all of you who have come here today to oh, come here. I still talk as if we're all in person, but I'm going to act as if we're in person. Um, thank you so much for attending uh, today's lecture. I'm really so honored to be here, um, especially as the Dumanyan uh, Visiting Associate Professor of Armenian Studies. Um, I would like to thank the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations, or NELC, as I've learned um, it's called here at the university, particularly Eliza Higby, Amanda Young, Franklin Lewis, um, Holly Schisler, and Haripsime Harutunyan, all of whom have been so welcoming and just really welcoming, you know, great about helping me acclimate to the new community and all of that. I also want to thank Franklin and Marshall for giving me the sabbatical that has allowed me to be um, in Chicago during this time. I'd also like to give a very special thanks to Mrs. Dumanyan who and her family who have made this fellowship and this position possible. Um, I really can't express how special this kind of position is. For most of us who work in Armenian studies, we work at colleges and universities that are wonderful, but we rarely get an opportunity to teach a class that is so focused on our area of research. And so working with my class has been, and talking about Armenian Indian diaspora and cultural production has been such a joy and um, I'm really so grateful uh, to be here and especially to join such an august and impressive um, list of Dumanian professors who have come before me. So thank you everybody who has made this possible. So some of you may be aware of the date that's approaching, April 24, which is on Saturday. That's the date when we commemorate the more than 1 million lives we lost in the genocide of 1915. This year's commemoration is particularly poignant um, as, well, not only for the rumored potential recognition of the genocide by President Biden, and you'll get a very mixed response from Armenians <laughs> about this. There's those who are like so happy and thinking like, yes, it's definitely gonna happen. There are those who are thinking we've been here before and we know how it usually goes. Um, and so just as with any group, there's very little homogeneity in responses, but I have to say like, this is the most hopeful I think we have felt in a long time. So, so we'll all be watching for April 24 to see what, um, what happens. So this year's commemoration is particularly poignant, poignant, not only for the rumored potential recognition, but for the fact that it comes on the heels of the cruelties inflicted by 2020, aside from the pandemic, which has touched every single one of us, two events took place that were particularly devastating in very deep cutting and irrevocable ways, two additional etchings on the palimpsest of Armenian pain. First, on August 4, 2020, there was an explosion in Beirut, where my family is from, that caused more than 200 deaths, left almost 300,000 people without shelter, and resulted in approximately $15 billion worth of property damage. All this took place in the midst of the pandemic and an already crushing economic crisis. The port where the blast occurred was only a few miles from the historic Armenian, from historic Armenian quarters and neighborhoods, including one named Karantina, yes, quarantine, the, neighbor that's, the neighborhood that served as a refugee camp for survivors of the genocide. Video footage from the blast showed a devastated Armenia street and a devastated Hajan, a neighborhood named after the village in the Ottoman Empire from which a number of the survivors had come. The layers of symbolism here were enough to make one choke. The blast was also a stark reminder of the limits of diaspora. Beirut, to the Armenians who lost their lives, to the Armenians who lost their home, was there, was theirs. For as much as diasporas are understood to be oriented around an elsewhere, a somewhere else, Beirut was theirs as much as it was anybody else's. And even more so for those Armenians who arrived there as refugees, Beirut was their beginning. A little less than two months later, another stark reminder to those in diaspora that the elsewhere around which our imaginations were oriented, the Armenia of our longing, was but a very real place. On September 27, a war broke out in Artsakh, or Nagorno-Karabakh, Nagorno devastating the Armenian population indigenous to the area. In the midst of the war came hate crimes against Armenians in the US and Turkey. 
the discourse emanating from the upper echelons of the Azerbaijani and Turkish governments sounded all too familiar, carrying echoes of a genocide that still today remains contested. In fact, just this week, both the BBC and The Guardian had articles about The Guardian with those ever-present quotation marks around, the, around what sometimes we somewhat jokingly refer to as the G word. Once again, it felt to Armenians, our voices already hoarse as if we were screaming into a void. So in the midst of all this, this 2020 that could not get any worse, it felt, I began to think inexplicably about joy. Not so much think about it, but long for it, desire it. I needed to feel joyful, to know that somewhere in my Armenianness was a capacity to feel joy. I needed to know that being joyful was as much a part of being Armenian as anything else. That there was something besides pain, besides the screaming, besides the desire for visibility. I felt a bit of shame. How could I think about this now with everything that's going on to the, my relatives, to the people I don't even know, how lucky I am that I'm not going through any of this. How can I be thinking about this? For those of us in diaspora especially, our moments, our sights of becoming, to borrow Hamid Nafisi's phrasing, seemed utterly and inextricably tied to the traumas that had brought us, our grandparents, our great-grandparents, to the traumas that had brought us here, the traumas that served as the sites of both our endings and our beginnings, and the traumas that continue to be comfortably looped into the narrative of Armenianness. And after all, how much of our visibility has been tied to getting the world to believe our pain? We submit as evidence pictures of our ancestors, their bodies broken, ravaged, and distended, pictures of the dead piled into heaps of bodily decay, the forlorn stares of the survivors, the images of crumbling pillaged sites of heritage and markers of a once great civilization. For myself, an Armenian who grew up in Tulsa, Oklahoma without an IAN, to my name, my point of entry to those who often looked at me quizzically, seemingly doubting of my claims to be Armenian. The genocide was my point of entry, an affirmation of my belonging. My mother's parents were orphaned, I would say. My father's parents escaped. If these traumas narrativize, to borrow Hayden White's terminology, if they structure and provide coherence to a diaspora otherwise marked by its heterogeneity, then joy can at best be understood as ancillary, detached from the becoming that marks our being. But any Armenians listening now <laughs> know this is hardly the totality of us. Any Armenian who has heard an uncle or a baba hold forth as if addressing the UN at a Sunday kebab. Any Armenian who has been fed to bursting by our tantigs and by our moms. Any Armenian who has had to tell their American friends watching in horror as two grown men fight over who is going to pay the bill at a restaurant. Say, they're saying, don't worry, don't worry, they're not really fighting. Any Armenian who has danced for hours at a kef or a wedding, don't tell them that Armenians don't know how to feel joy. But these moments, these moments of joy seem to exist on another realm, on another plane. The songs at the weddings and the picnics and the kebabs, those songs played on a cassette deck someone lugged with them, those songs played by musicians, often playing, musicians often playing by ear, playing for hours and hours, outlasting even the dancers, their brains an archive of the unwritten, of the beautifully, gloriously mundane. And by mundane, I mean of the earth, like just of, of, the, of the now. Loc these kefs and weddings located in rented out community centers, parks, backyards, and church basements. These songs that make visible the material conditions and worlds that are made invisible when the Disney Concert Hall or Lincoln Center programs works by our beloved Armenian composer and folklorist Gomidas, allowing Armenian folk songs to intermingle with the sonic worlds evoked by Western classical music. So what then are these songs so deeply entrenched in the present? These songs that aren't written about in the books, that aren't written about in the encyclopedias, that aren't, that aren't taken as markers of Armenianness, that exist in another realm. Where do these songs so deeply entrenched in our, in our fragmented, sorry, fragmented presence, where do they belong? 
in our fragmented realities, they are evocative not of our coherence, but of our multiplicities and various elsewheres. Elsewheres that unabashedly cross borders, flouting the regimes of the nation state, and some would say flouting good taste in general. What do we do with these songs, these songs that bring us joy, that but yet disrupt these narratives of cohesiveness and coherence that may give us purpose? Are they to remain our little secret? But what if we were to locate our, what if we were to locate in them our sites of becoming? What would happen if this is where we began to locate our meaningness in these moments of joy? So please consider my presentation today, my love letter to the parts of ourselves that sustain and are life-giving and, and also a grappling with the vulnerabilities exposed by these parts and the ways these songs have had to remain on another more hidden plane in the name of visibility and legibility in the West. In doing so today, I'll be sharing with you a little bit about my family, how I locate joy, how I locate my sites of, of becoming as an Armenian. And I will also be making fun of my dad's musical taste a little bit. So, so there will be something for, for everybody. So at the end of this, um, at the end of this, please, you know, I'm really looking forward to your questions and also for the Armenians in the audience or even for non-Armenians who, who who have are familiar with the music, please do share, you know, what has what brings you joy and the songs that you remember when you think about being joyful in um, as an Armenian. So I would love to hear about those songs. So before I move forward, um, this love letter that I'm going to be talking to you about today could not have been written, could not have been written without the names that you see here. Throughout my research, I have had the utter honor of being taken in by musicians and scholars who are absolute geniuses at what they do and whose knowledge of Armenian music or however you define Armenian music far exceeds anything that I can ever hope to attain. These are people that often I would call at a moment's notice and they would invite me to their homes and give me food and talk to me about music, lovingly scold me when I got, you know, when I got things wrong and treated me like one of their own, no matter what. And for them, I will be truly grateful. And these are names that I hope, you know, um, everybody recognizes. John Bilazikjan, who unfortunately passed away not too long ago in 2015. Barbara Chukasian, who a quote I'm going to be sharing from her later on, and her husband John Chukasian. Um, Ara Dingjian, the indefatigable Ara Dingjian, who is so absolutely remarkable. His father, Onik Dingjian, who I've not met, but I'm obsessed with, um, he just received an NEA uh, fellow. He just became an NEA fellow. And there was a remarkable, um, uh, uh, remarkable uh, video, video in his honor. And so I hope everybody can look at that. Mark Gavur, Harold Hagopian, Richard Hagopian, the most incredible musician. We're going to be listening to some of his works. Harry Kazelian, uh, an archivist like no other. Um, my auntie, my tante Gneli Kutnerian, who I have bothered for translations more than anybody in the world because she fluently speaks both Eastern and Western Armenian. And so, um, so yeah, I consider her sort of my co-author. Kenneth Sarajan, who is an alum of FNM and where I teach. And one day completely out of the blue, I was sitting in my office and I get a phone call and I pick it up and without even a hello, the person on the other end said, what in the world is an Armenian doing teaching music at FNM? And it was Kenneth Sarajan who had somehow found me through like an alum network. And ever since then, he's been, he's been a wonderful resource. Ara Tupuzian, who made a documentary about Armenian music in Detroit and Steve Bospigyan, one of the um, inheritors of the amazing Bospigyan tradition. So, um, the last thing that I wanted to say was I also, given the date that's coming up, I also wanted to honor my grandparents, um, Ephraim Alajaji, Hasmig Alajaji, Ephraim who came from Urfa, um, Hasmig who came from Arapir, Garabed Mekhdasian, my, my mother's father from Kharpert, Anjal Mekhdasian from Yozgat, 
and Arusiag Muradyan from Yozgat. So Arusiag, so my grandparents on my mother's side were both, um, were both orphaned. And Arusiag, we called her Yaya, they met at the orphanage and she became a part of the family. So my, my grandmother and my grandfather met at the orphanage and Arusiag or Yaya became a part of the family. And so I can't not include her um, as part of this. So, so they have all passed, but they are, they are here with me all the time. So my joy, when when 2020 became too much, when especially at the height of Artsakh and after what had happened in Beirut, I realized that to look for the joy, to look for joy, to understand that I was going to have to sort of brought, you know, was make more narrow my scope a little bit. And so where did I go? I went to pictures. Perhaps this is something that many of us do. I went to the pictures that I had my parents on both sides, my grandparents on both sides had so little. And what I have carried with me, what my parents have been able to give us every now and then are these pictures that they happen to find. And on one of my parents' trips to Beirut a few years ago, they came back with some pictures that I had never seen before. And these pictures just completely blew me away because they revealed to me a side of my grandfather that I had heard about, but I got to see it. So when we're talking about, you know, the genocide and the survivors, again, like it's usually in these very bleak settings that we see them because we're trying to convince them that the genocide happened. Like here are the victims, victim, victim, victim. And so here are two orphans and they've grown up, they've, they're independent now, they're living in Beirut. My grandfather opens up a grocery store where he travels back and forth to Turkey, getting goods for the grocery store. And so this is a picture of him at the grocery store on the left. And then the, on the right is a picture of him with my mother, who's the baby, and my aunties, and my, and Yaya, and my grandmother, and another woman that they also called auntie from the orphanage. And so I just want to talk about my grandpa for just a second. Because when I think about music, when I think about joy, it, part of the motivation is to render, to render the, the, the survivors in three dimensions. So one thing that I love about these pictures is that when my mom saw the grocery store picture, the first thing that she said was she sort of rolled her eyes and she said, you know, there was nobody on the phone, meaning he picked up the phone just to pose for that picture. And so there's this awareness, like he, he has this image that he wants to put forth. And he had that beret. He never did not wear the beret. It was part of his look. Every single picture, you see him wearing the beret. And so this was a man who took great care in his appearance and how he was seen. And one other thing I forgot to mention is, so my grandfather was, um, we believe he was around three years old when he was uh, sent from, the, from his village on those death marches. Um, and along the way, he lost an eye. And so I don't know if you can quite tell from these pictures, but he, he only has one eye, but that didn't stop him. He, he presented himself with such strength and confidence and just, you know, charisma. And, and so I, that's why I absolutely fell in love with these pictures. And of course, this amazing picture in front of the Lebanese flag and him posed there, the center of the family, smoking the argile or, or acting like he has the argile. But there was one other picture that has stayed with me ever since. And this is one out on the balcony. And I don't know if you can tell, I have a very sort of sloppily drawn circle around his face here, but he's smiling. He's smiling and he's mischievous. And it's like he has like a joke, like an inside joke or something. And he's sort of like, he's not gonna tell anybody, but it's, it's his to keep. And so when I think about joy, I think about these pictures because it's so easy to look at the news and to look at these, the narratives of Armenianness that exist. And I'm going to talk about some of these narratives, um, as, especially as it comes to music. But for me personally, I had to go start there. That's where I had to start to remember that there's more to this 
than than what we are than what than than what meets the eye, and so so thank you for indulging me just a little bit. But that's sort of what has inspired this 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 sort of meditation that I'm on um, about Armenian joy. So the next part of it, and what has inspired the title of my talk today, are parents' songs. So if there's anything that if I was to locate the site of my becoming. So I grew up in Tulsa, Oklahoma, very, very few Armenians. You can imagine that this was not a, a hub for, for Armenians at the time. So there was a very small group of us, but my gosh, like if I tell you, you know, you, you have to believe me how much love we were surrounded by. The Armenians that were there all came from different places. Some were from Syria, some were from Iran, some were, as they say, America High, like they were from the United States. So we were this total mishmash of differing types of Armenians, differing, ty different, ty different types of uh, Armenian languages, differing histories, differing you know, narratives. And yet we found a way to, to be coherent to, to each other and to, to, to be one. And often the, the sites of our coming together were often sort of moments of commemoration, such as the genocide. But there were also moments that we came together that were for joy, for joyous reasons. Now going back and forth in the car, sort of the car as this sort of symbol of our liminality, these, this, you know, between spaces, my father always would play this cassette tape that he had brought with him from Beirut. So the picture I have here of the cassette tape is um, I think the latest iteration of it because it kept getting frayed and frayed and frayed. And so he would like dump, put it on another cassette. This cassette, if there's anything that sort of marks the sonic world in which I grew up, it's this cassette. And it's also the cassette that to me was the site of my becoming Armenian. And now that might sound strange because if you've looked at the list so far, there's, there are Armenian songs on there, but that's hardly the entirety of it. There's a wide mix of songs. So just to go through the list very quickly. So my very intellectual annotations are right next to the um, to the to the song to the artist. So you know you can be very impressed by how um, intelligent I am. So Feiruz, of course, there was Feiruz on here. We're talking about somebody from Beirut. So Feiruz is the iconic you know Lebanese singer. Um, Johnny Cash, love it, of course. Why wouldn't a boy from Beirut put Johnny Cash on his on his cassette tape? Adis. Any Armenians in the audience right now, there's no that you cannot not have Adis on this tape. So Adis is a big duh. Um, Hava Nagila is on this tape. Amazing. How did Hava Nagila get there? Um, Russian military marches. I still want my dad to explain this to me. Um, ABBA, obviously, it was the 70s. Lots of Arabic pop, lots of Armenian pop and who knows what else. And so I think my dad is here on the Zoom. So I'm sure I'll be properly <laughs> yelled at afterwards. But so it's very simple to look at this and see it as sort of like the hybrid or the, the hybridity of the, of the diasporic or the exilic. Like this is sort of him taking fragments and of, of the different parts of himself and putting it on this cassette and, and it traveling with him to Tulsa. But I think there's something a little bit more subversive about this and a little bit more, I think there's something a little bit more to say about it than just that. Because on one hand, it's very consistent with what any youth around his age would be listening to. But on the other hand, when looked at in the context of what it is to be Armenian and the various narratives that existed at the time, we see what this cassette represents in just a little bit of a different way. And so, so we'll, be, we'll be coming back to that in just a second. So when, we, when I talk about sort of these parts of ourselves that aren't on the level of, of other parts of the Armenian narrative. So if you ask anybody, you know, what is Armenian music? More than likely, they're going to say something about folk music, about somebody named Gomidas, for example. So there are certain sites uh, within the Armenian musical narrative that have come to symbolize Armenian nests, whether in the diaspora or in, in the country of Armenia. So what you get is a consistency that sort of creates this coherent narrative. 
Okay, so that you can go to any Armenian anywhere and everybody knows, yes, Gomidas, or they know, yes, Khachadurian, yes, Babajanian. Like there's, there's these elements of Armenianness, of this narrative that are legible and coherent and create a very, very neat little thread. Okay, so what I'm looking at are those Armenian musical narratives that push up against that other narrative that is sort of, that has sort of come to be expected. So what do we do with those parts of ourselves that don't fit this, this bigger picture? Now, one thing that I wanna do is think about this bigger picture and how that came to be, or that, that more established sort of narrative. And so there's a few things at work here. So one is looking at sort of the, the body of knowledge that existed regarding Armenians in the West. So Armenians who existed in the West, right, had to sort of um, structure themselves or shape themselves within the gaze of the US and the modalities that existed here. And so speaking about Armenian music, you had to speak about it in a way that made sense to this new home that, that existed. Okay, so it both made sense in this new home, but also it played to the needs and desires of this Armenian community. So an Armenian community that had just come from the Ottoman Empire that sees back home all this tumult, all this, you know, uh, these massacres, they need to go help home, right? And so they have to sort of play this game in the US where they present themselves as the good, quote unquote, Oriental, right? They present themselves as the good, the Christian Oriental. And they start to have this sort of um, negotiating with the narratives that have been imposed upon them and finding ways to express themselves within this narrative, okay? So what we're going to see here is sort of a breaking apart of various ways of being Armenian in the United States. And so this, this love letter that I'm writing to these songs that don't get talked about, at least not in any sort of, you know, like academ you know, academic kind of way, these songs start to present something rather troubling to this overall narrative. So one thing that I wanna do um, just briefly is sort of get a sense of, okay, what did Americans or the British think about, or what did they know of Armenian music? So, so what was it, what was the language that existed there about Armenian music and how did Armenians sort of negotiate uh, within that? So one of the earliest, one of the earliest English language um, documents regarding Armenian music, um, at least that I found, I'm sure there's some earlier, but this is from 1852, um, written by Leo Alishan. And he's writing to the British. So he's writing from Venice and um, he's, he's addressing this to, as you see, to the British public. So it's saying to your enterprising spirit of inquiry, which more than any other nation has extended its researches into the regions of the East, this little collection of Armenian popular songs is presented. It is not to be denied that from a nation like the Armenian, which boasts and justly of being one of the most ancient of the East. So take note of some things here because we're going to see it repeated over and over. It is not, it is, sorry, it is not be denied that from a nation like the Armenian, which boasts unjustly of being one of the most ancient of the East and which has possessed for so long a period the advantages of a cultivated and flourishing literature, something more copious and elegant might have been expected. But considering the frequent revolutions of that unhappy nation and the incursions of so many barbarous tribes, which during the oppressive slavery to which they reduced its inhabitants, not only destroyed its arts and literature, but even extinguished the last gleam of the poetic fire of the sons of Ararat. It is hoped that even this humble collection offered as a specimen only for the first time translated into a European language may find favor with a people so enlightened and one that so greatly encourages every work calculated to illustrate any portion of the vast field of the ancient East. So a lot of this is fairly typical of what you would expect of sort of the Oriental other in their sort of very obsequious um, uh, uh, communication with the, with the British. But there are a few themes here that we're going to see playing out, playing throughout sort of one of the things being this emphasis on the Armenians being ancient, again, emphasizing the, the, the how old the civilization is, how far back into history going, really establishing that sort of presence. 
The other part of it that we're going to be seeing, so this is 18, 1852, right? Up until like a hundred, more than a hundred years later, we're going to see similar sort of, of, of uh, a similar sort of discourse. But this, again, this distinction between the Armenians and the surrounders. So we might be from this area, we might be geographically from this area, but we're nothing like that, like them. In fact, they're barbarous. And you will see that our music is completely different from them. And so, so two things here, establishing that sort of ancientness, right? That rootedness of, of the Armenians and the music, right? But also that separation that we might be there, but we're not that, okay? So that was 1852. Now fast forward a little bit um, around 1915, 1919, and you start to see in newspapers, this violinist, Hai Gudenyan, He's performing all over the United States, attempting to raise money for, for what's going on in the Ottoman Empire at the time. So you see like the Syrian relief, you know, the Armenian and Syrian relief campaign. And so what's so fascinating is how Gudanyan is talked about by these newspapers. So I know the writing is very, very small, but Gudenyan is often, you know, unsurprisingly talked about as being sort of a native informant type who, and I can't remember if it's here or if it's in this one. Um, somewhere here it says, sorry, I should, I, I should have uh, made this a little bit bigger, but somewhere it says, Gudenyan is relating to us the music of the native, but in a way not that the natives play it in the way that they aspire to play it. And so again, this sort of, you know, othering of the Armenians, but by making them, by making the opening up the possibility for them to become, to, for them to become, uh, you know, more Western oriented. There's the possibility there. That's what you'll see in a lot of these. There's always that room, that, that, that sort of arbitrariness, that, that borderline that the Armenians occupy. In a lot of these newspapers or in, the, in these news clippings, they're talked about as being other, but with the possibility of being able to come to that other side. Now think about what's at stake here. So it's one thing for me to sort of lament that these other songs that I that I you know locate as like the site of our joy, the site of our you know of our community of our commu of our coming together. What does it? What is at stake if we bring those into the narrative? So right now, right, the, this is 19, these clippings are all from 1918, 1919. So, you know, so the genocide has happened. It's, it's somewhat still going on. There are refugees, there are orphans. It's a despicable, horrific, tragic situation. And so this violinist is going around raising money. Who is hiring him to, you know, who is the one giving him the money? Who is he having to appeal to? There's a gaze to which he must appeal. And so what a lot, what worked, right, was again, presenting yourself as other enough, but, but just uh, enough like them that they opened the doors to let him in. And so what's interesting is that the music itself becomes a part of this narrative. The music is somewhat oriental, somewhat oriental, but when played correctly, like Hai Gudenyan does, it sounds like, it sounds like something that we could perform in a concert hall. So these clippings are utterly fascinating relics of a certain time period. And it's, it is one thing to look at them like that, but what I would offer, and, and it's not that, you know, not, not that radical of a notion, but these became parts of a body of knowledge about Armenians that for as they kept coming to the state, as they kept coming to the West after the genocide, that they realized that this was the discourse about them that existed. And so how to best strategize within there was about conforming somewhat to that with an element of agency by being able to sort of dictate, you know, what are you going to play when and that sort of thing. So some of these articles are utterly fascinating. This, the second one here, that, that, um, that longer one, oh, that, that is a picture of Hike, by the way. 
So that longer one, that's actually from a gossip column. And in this, she's just going on and on and on about the poor Armenian women, about how they're treated by men and all this stuff. There's another article about how at one of these fundraisers for the Syrian and Armenian relief campaign, the society women dressed in oriental costume as part of the, as part of the events. And so again, this is, once again, these are just very interesting sort of um, uh, messages to us today about what Armenians were sort of having to navigate when they, when they came to the United States. Now, Haik himself was not voiceless. He was not just showing up to these, to these you know, benefits and just playing and, and having money thrown at him and ending it there. He became an active contributor uh, in terms of, of introducing Armenian music to the West. And so he has a few contributions where he says the music where the music of the Armenians, this is from 1918 in a journal called Violin World. And here again, we see very much an echo of what we've been talking about, talking about Armenian music as being ancient, as, as being you know, tied to this, this great civilization, this time period from the past. And he has here a section, the story of Armenian music. In the beginning of the third century, Gregory the Illuminator introduced Christianity into Armenia as the national religion. Again, marking the beginning of Armenianness, which includes music, which includes the narrative as you know, this moment when Armenia became Christian and the, the strategy sort of behind that, you know, why that would work or why that would play, I guess you could say, in the United States and in, in England. And what's interesting is how music sort of gets swept up into that narrative. So the ancientness, the Christianity, and then at the end there, another remarkable characteristic of, of the Armenian music is that it alone of the Oriental music is divided into classical and popular. So it alone of the Oriental music. So it's saying again, here's how we're different from the barbarous clans around us. That has nothing to do with us. That music around us is not what we're like at all. We have our own unique music. This is how it is. This is what it sounds like. And it just so happens that it sounds nice to Western ears. So again, this is, this is all sort of very much by, by design. Um, so that's Rai Haig, and then in 1925, there's this another amazing relic, um, an article called Exotic Music, and so this is by an American music scholar, and here he's trying to, he's locating, he wants to find out the essence of exotic music. So again, exotic music as something that is definable down to its very essence. And so he's using as the as the sort of um, narrator of exotic music. He's using Gudenyan. Again, we come back to Gudenyan. I have just on October second, uh, nineteen twenty-five, been bearing an Armenian, Mr. Haid Gudenyan, play music of the half a dozen nationalities which border the Eastern Mediterranean. And so he, you know, he has his, he studied violin with these Western composers. So he has his, you know, he has his, uh, a, a good, you know, a good background there. But again, using this sort of Armenian figure as the way of better understanding Armenianness and Armenian music. And so he goes into these things about how Mr. Gudenyan plays and, and, and whatever it might be. Um, and I just want to highlight one particular section. So it's that small section on the right side, the, the top there. It says, Mr. Gudenyan does, does for these Levant melodies what Ratan Devi did for Hindu melodies. The claim which both have made good is to present not the music actually made by the native singer or player, but the music that they aspire to make. So this is the second time we're seeing this. Um, it was mentioned also in the newspaper articles that I, that I um, had put there. So again, a way of making this music, you know, visible and legible and knowable and by, and by extension making the Armenians visible, knowable and legible was by grasping onto this discourse of ancientness and otherness, but just the right kind of otherness, again, that makes it somewhat acceptable for polite society when they're putting on benefits to, to, to raise money. And so just to sort of show, you know, again, this sort of discursive framing, how, how deeply entrenched it becomes, 
here's an article from 1961, so not terribly long ago, but in ethnomusicology, and where they're talking about how to write review record reviews. And so this is what they're recommending. This is what the woman who's the record, the record review editor is recommending. For example, if an Armenian record is reviewed, the reviewer should perhaps tell us first about Armenian music in general, then about the sector which the record relates to, then give a brief characterization of that music. So I find it fascinating here, again, that the reviewer should perhaps tell us first about Armenian music in general. So as if it's something, imagine, you know, let's replace Armenian with American, like it sounds utterly ridiculous. But still this, the, this idea that what Armenian music is can be distilled to an essence. Now let's think about what's at stake here because for Armenians in diaspora or Armenians in exile who have this upheaval at home, who are, who are contending with this rupture, who are contending with the trauma that just occurred, this, still, this is an opportunity to sort of control the narrative. And so Gayatri Spivak calls it an, a strategic essentialism, right? It's not an essentialism that can be easily dismissed because often this sort of essentialization of the self is the only opportunity you have to speak, right? And so, so even in this record review, so anybody who gets a record of Armenian music, right? They're being told, if you are going to review this music, first tell us what Armenian music is like. And then, and then sort of compare, you know, review the, the, the record or whatever it might be to that. So that leaves open, what is Armenian music? What is the thing that we're going to be comparing to? And so the other sort of interesting thing about this is, you know, think about potential audience appeal, the quality of recording. And this is really interesting, the quality of performance. Is it authentic, but ugly or dull? Is it authentic and attractive? Is it a trained singer with arch style unsuitable to music sung? So again, these aesthetic standards are being applied that one has to ask, you know, where are these standards coming from? And how much, what can Armenians do to somewhat control these aesthetic views of how the music is, is received and understood. So it's one thing to look at those and say, okay, those were so long ago, you know, relics of their time. But again, I would urge us to see this as sort of a production of knowledge and whether or not, you know, however we might feel about it, it becomes something to contend with. So what we've seen so far is this, the emphasis on the ancientness of Armenian music, the emphasis on the difference between Armenian music and what's surrounding it. So this sort of emphasis on an essence or an authenticity to Armenian music. And often in the, the articles that I showed you, there's sort of an, there's sort of a, an apology that's, that's located there too. Like, we're sorry because we constantly were occupied, because we were constantly, you know, have, you know, have these barbarous invaders coming. Our music did sort of start to take on their elements, you know, but there is, I promise you, there is an Armenian essence there. There is something there. And so you see sort of that, that those apologetics play into how Armenian music is being represented um, uh, at that time. So what's interesting, and this is sort of where, you know, my own uh, background now comes back because, so I told you a little bit about how I grew up in Tulsa, Oklahoma, very detached from sort of a major Armenian center and my father's music and my mother's music, like as being like where I felt joy, where I felt that connection. Well, I graduated from college and I decided to become what every um, immigrant parent wishes for their child to become, and that was an ethnomusicologist. So they were very, very proud of me, and I, and they are here today, so we're we're cool now. But um, so I so I went to grad school. I'm looking at ethnomusicology, and I start to open the textbooks. And I realize, and you know, not this wasn't a huge surprise, but the things that I held the most dear, the things that I, I knew to be Armenian, the things that I associated with my joy, with my becoming Armenian, none of those were in the book. Or if they were, they were sort of referred to in interesting kinds of ways. So 
One of the biggest texts in ethnomusicology or in world music is the Garland Encyclopedia of World Music. So it's just this, you know, monumental work, um, epic. Like they're 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 huge, and they've really done an amazing job, sort of like locating a lot of musics that otherwise might be lost. But I found the, um, the entry on the Armenian diaspora in the U.S. rather interesting, and, and here are two passages. First, um, in the Armenian context, the musical representation of nationalism is even more complex. Older generations of Armenian Americans were brought up singing Turkish songs and playing Turkish style music. The second passage, Armenians, because they come from a handful of nations have long been recognized for their ability to master diverse styles. Today, however, the performance of a particular style may be more a matter of survival than choice. So the implication here is that there is some sort of, you know, knowable Armenian ness, like a knowable way of being Armenian or, or playing Armenian music. And yet, and yet, there are older generations who sang Turkish. There are, uh, you know, there are other musicians who played, you know, a handful of styles. There's no acknowledgement that Armenians had a hand and may have accepted those musics as their own, that, that there wasn't this sort of separation. Now that did come a little bit later. I'm not going to pretend that there wasn't, and my book is about this, that there wasn't intense controversy that was to come from a lot of these Turkish language songs. However, this is really not even allowing for the, for the possibility that the songs that represent the sort of fragmented realities of the Armenian diaspora, those songs at the kefs, those songs at the weddings, those songs that, that can be traced to certain Ottoman villages, that, that there might be a way of, of understanding those discursively that allows them to be a part of Armenian identity and not something just entirely separate. And so again, you know, say you don't know much about Armenian music, again, it's, uh, it's, it's the borders that are drawn between it and the surrounding musics are what come up, okay? Um, and then there's the other matter of comidas. So this is one of the first times I'm giving a talk that on Armenian music that is not about comidas, and it feels a little bit you know, strange for me. If any of you know anything about Armenian music, you know it's almost impossible to talk about Armenian music without talking about Gomidas. So Gomidas was somebody who survived, um, who was arrested on April 24, 1915. Um, he did not die, he was not killed, but he ended up sort of losing his mind and he died in a mental um, hospital outside of Paris a few years later. So Gomidas was, is really sort of how to describe this. He's become a metonym really, or a synecdoche for the Armenian, for the, for Armenians worldwide. He has become sort of the vessel through which Armenians mourn, through which Armenians have come to know themselves. And so here we see how Gomidas is talked about. Gomidas laid the foundations of a national music culture, purifying Armenian music of all foreign influences in the course of, and this is from 2008, from the Carnegie Hall Playbill, in the course of centuries of subjugation to Islamic culture, not only the folk song and popular music of urban, urban Armenians, but also the music of the church has been thoroughly impregnated with foreign influences, Turkish, Arabic, and Persian musical styles, the native traditional musical style all but disappeared. So again, we keep seeing this emphasis on this narrative that doesn't look very different from what we were seeing almost a hundred years ago. And I'm not saying that, you know, that these Armenians who are speaking for the Armenians are doing something wrong, right? Because it's not that simple. It's not that simple. There's a body of knowledge that exists. There are sort of these, these East-West modalities that exist in the US. And for Armenians to come to be known, for Armenians to know themselves, they have to adjust to these modalities. And so, and on top of that, on top of that, when we're talking about genocide denial for the Armenians to be able to sort of claim that the genocide happened, right? To get that acceptance from the West sort of necessitates this positioning for better or for worse, this, this sort of positioning as like the good, the good oriental other. And so, so you see sort of this, this discursive um, framing that occurs somewhat repeatedly. Now, 
I want to emphasize that my comments are completely divorced from what actually what Gomidas was actually doing. So this is not about Gomidas, but how Gomidas is talked about today. So I want to be very clear about that, that there is the work itself, right? But then how do we translate it to an audience outside of the Armenians? So if this is the narrative, if this is this idea of purity and authenticity is what's sort of guiding the Armenian musical narrative, then we get a better sense of why these other musics that represent the heterogeneity of Armenians, that represent the, the, the mixing that, that we've been talking about, why they, they render this narrative particularly, particularly vulnerable. And I just saw the time, so please stick around because I will be stick playing some good music, so I won't be talking much more. But I want to just sort of share some quotes real quick to help our, our to help sort of frame the discussion maybe a little bit more clearly. So one thing that you're going to find, Hai Gudanyan did this, um, you know, in his in his writing often, and then the proceedings of the International uh, Music Society, Armenian Music Society, did this too. They often tell the Armenian the, the story of Armenian music, and the story always has a very certain always has a very specific starting point. The story of the Armenians begins when they became Christian. And so I want to think about this sort of in the Saidian sense and what this sort of framing does. When you establish such a specific beginning, what comes out of that? There's a, there's a purpose to that. There's something that comes from that. So Said says, a beginning, quote, foresees a continuity that flows from it. This allows us to initiate, to direct, to measure time, to construct work, to discover, to produce knowledge. So this beginning, allows us to create a narrative of Armenian music. And this narrative is what makes us visible in the West. This narrative is what gives us, gives Armenians somewhat of a legibility in the West. And so, you know, again, just because, you know, given the, the circumstances here, this is something that we can sort of unpack a lot more, but we can't think about this narrative that exists about Armenian music as existing in a vacuum. There's survival at stake here and there's needs at stake here. And so this narrative fulfills a very specific purpose. But what I'm talking about though, is so then what happens to these other parts of ourselves? Where do they go and what do we do with them? These ones that trouble that narrative. So Jacqueline Rose in Freud and the Non-European has this passage about what comes of this trauma and I'm going to quickly share it with you and then we'll get to music. What a people have in common, Freud suggests, is a trauma, a knowledge, to return to the quote from Said's beginnings. So devastating as to be unbearable in one's own sight and only slightly more bearable as a subject of psychoanalytic investigation. This is, if you like, the other half of the story. For trauma, far from generating freedom, openness to others, as well as to the divided and unresolved fragments of a self, leads to a very different kind of fragmentation, one which is, in Freud's own words, devastating and causes identities to batten down, to go exactly the other way. Fragmentation can engender petrification just, that can, just as it can be a consequence of historical alienation that a people far from dispersing themselves start digging for a history to legitimate the violence of the state. So there's this fragmentation, right? The, this, this fragmented identity is something as Freud is saying, you know, that works against this need for a fixed identity. The, he calls it the fixity, like there's a fixity of identity here. And so these musics that we've sort of relegated to other realms, to other planes of Armenian-ness or to other planes of Armenian consciousness, there seems to be something inherently somewhat threatening about them, especially in light of the sort of broader trauma that, that, that we are, are talking about. This coherence, this legibility, this, this continuity that comes from these narratives sparked by that beginning, that is something to hold on to. That is something to hold on to. But yet there is that other part of it. Um, I'm going to skip this one just for time. There's a really powerful quote from Mark Nishanyan that I'd like to share here. 
um, in talking about what it is to speak to that gaze. Um, I have felt shame every time we spoke of ourselves. For each time we spoke of ourselves, we did not speak to ourselves. Each time an appeal was made to a third party, to the West, to the observer, to what Hagop Oshagan called civilized humanity. And thus I have felt shame continuously. As survivors, we have never ceased, in fact, to appeal to the external gaze. In the moment of this appeal, it is testimony that was constituting me. It was constituting me by the shame I was feeling, by my belonging to this we I have just uttered, under the gaze of the civilized other, by this gaze itself. So there's nobody more aware of this gaze than Armenians themselves, and especially Armenians who have dedicated their lives to playing this music that, that has been relegated to this sort of other sphere. There were two very poignant moments in the course of my interviews, these quotes that were, one was in Beirut, one was in, in Fresno, and they were not at the same time. These were two people who did not even know each other, but there was a striking similarity to how they spoke about the, those musics that aren't sort of um, made central to the Armenian musical narrative. So this first one was by Barbara Chukasian, who said this to me with tears in her eyes. And she's relaying to me a wedding that she had just been to. She said, and she's talking about dancing with somebody at the, at the wedding or, or dancing with a friend of hers. She said, I will never forget what he said. As we were dancing, my friend turned to me and with a smile on his face, he said, this music, it isn't Armenian, but it kept us Armenian. And then she said to me, please write that down. Yes, it may not be Armenian, but it did. It kept us Armenian. And after that, she repeated again, please write this down. Like, may, if you're going to write a book about this, please include this music. Like, talk about it because it's not getting talked about, at least not on this level. Armenians talk about it, but it's, it's the disruptiveness of it is something that, that has kept it from being talked about. And then in Beirut, talking about Adis. Why did we love Adis? I, I asked this man this question. Why did we love, love Adis? He made us Armenian. And so I followed up, typical sort of ethnomusicologist that I am, and just inquiring, okay, how did it make you Armenian? And, and I just kept trying to get some answer out of him. And any Armenian in the audience can imagine this, but he gave me sort of a gesture of annoyance, like, that's it, I'm done. And he said, it just did. Now listen. And so that's what I'm gonna do now. I'm gonna have you listen to this music and I want you to understand them as, as being these, these, these elements of, or, or a production of a moment in time when Armenians were, were sort of unabashedly taking and, and mixing and making music that, that they could claim as theirs, that, that brought them joy, that made them happy. Can it be linked to the past in any way? It's very funny because Karun Karun, which we're going to listen to by Adis Harmandian, which is like the, you know, sort of like the de facto Armenian national anthem, uh, at least to those of us in, from Beirut. Um, you know, there were people who I would ask about the song and they would, they would say like, you know, that comes from a melody by Gomidas. And I was like, I, I don't think that's true. And, and they would say like, ah, what do you know? And so I just sort of, but it was, there was this sort of desire to place it. Like if, if it's that important to us, then there has to be something about it that, that sort of links us to this past. Um, before I play the song, I want to draw your attention to this amazing memoir that was written uh, by Boros Shah Malikyan. This is the Armenian version. And so the translations are mine from the Armenian version. Um, and there is an English version out now, but he's talking about the emergence of these bands in Beirut and how they started. So there was a huge sort of scene of Armenian bands. And these Armenian bands at first would basically sing covers of European, uh, you know, like French pop songs or Turkish songs, but all they would do was sing them in Armenian. So he's talking about a moment that um, one of these bands, his band actually won this big Lebanese music competition called Pelmel. That day, Le Lunet Noir, which was his band, won first place among Lebanese bands. We participated with three songs, one of which was in Armenian, Ayo Ayo, music and lyrics by Ara Kekijan, who at that time would sing in Armenian when you could sing in French or English. 
And we won first place by singing Armenian. So first the scene developed with Armenian singing covers and just putting in Armenian words, which in itself was pretty radical for the time or was pretty amazing. But soon these bands, they started actually writing their own songs. And what happened next is really interesting. So here's what Boros says next. All those Armenian singers who had not recorded any Armenian songs and had even Europeanized their names started recording in Armenian. Harut Hopurian changed his stage name from King Arthur to Harupurian. Paul the Prince became Paul Bardadian. Maxim became Maxim Panosian. And most importantly, Adis Harmand became Adis Harmandian. So if you have your bottle of Arak nearby, you might want to grab it and have a drink while we listen to Adis um, sing Karun Karun. And you are more than encouraged to, to dance a little bit. Garun garune, siru siru sirune, et ko sev sev achero, yar jantu ayrune. Garun garun garune, siru siru sirune, et ko sev sev achero, yar jantu ayrune. Charle sune riha bata tim yara, arzun gnero balasre sev sev. Okay. So, so karun karun. I mean, when you look at it, karun karune, sirun sirune, sirun sirun sirune, et kosev sev achero viar janistun airumes. So, spring it is, lovely it is, with your black eyes, you set me on fire. Typical love song. There's not, on the surface, there's nothing that deep about it, but that is what made it so important. This was pop music that Armenians could happily, happily cling to. And I find it so fascinating that that the my interlocutor who I was speaking to said, this is what kept him Armenian. This is what kept him here. And so again, if we're thinking about this sort of narrative Armenianness, this sort of music really belongs in another realm, but one that sort of still is very meaningful to the Armenians themselves, especially the youth, especially of like my dad's generation, for example. This was pop music and it's an Armenian man singing to about a beautiful Armenian girl. And so this is, you know, of the community, it's of the time. And the truth is that people loved it. Like people outside of the Armenian community loved it. There was a version of it in Arabic that appeared in a Syrian television show. There were covers of it and you will not be surprised if you venture into YouTube, there are many arguments between Armenians and Azerbaijanis who, had, who are saying like, this is ours, no, this is ours, this is ours. So even this has not been immune to that. But it's fascinating to see just how widespread it was and what it meant to the Armenians for the, uh, from the community that this was uh, coming from. So because I'm running out of time, I'm sort of going to jump through these a little bit faster than I intended. But if we come back across the ocean to the United States, there was uh, this sort of um, kef genre of music. And so this genre of music, people like Richard Hagopian, people like Onik Tinkjan, people like Hachi, Kazar, uh, Hachi Kazarian, I'm so sorry. Um, these amazing, amazing artists who had, were keeping alive the folk songs that had come from the Ottoman Empire. So a lot of what they were singing was in Turkish or it was in English or it was in Armenian, but they were updating it to, to be relevant to the time period that they were in. So they were very much of the diaspora, of, of this sort of fragmented reality. One of the earliest bands that really made a name for themselves was the Vospigyan band in Philadelphia. And what I love about this song, this one is called Catskill in Jampan, which means on the road to the Catskills. So the Catskills in New York was uh, where the Armenians would go like for the summer, like that was where their destination was. And so you would go, you would leave the city and you would go to the mountains and that's where you would meet, commune with other Armenians, like there was a community there. And so there was a whole song about this. Now, like a lot of 
these songs, it can be traced to a quote unquote, and I'm only saying this just because it's sort of easier, but like a quote unquote Turkish song in the sense that it was written, it was in the Turkish language. So um, called Ben Bir Kasop. And so it was redone, it was remade, and then the Vospigans did their own version of it. And um, so this, the, the words are here on the road to the Catskill zigzag. I saw a girl round and chubby. The Golod Melor is not something that can be easily translated to English. The Armenians have like lovely words for, for chubby, like Lopig and like, you know, these. So anyway, so it's round and chubby, but that's like the best that I could do. Um, come, let's go. I'll give you jewels. Naughty girl, give me a kiss. So let's listen to this one. <laughs> So that's the Vospigyan band. And then, so I was going to end it here again. I apologize for, for speaking much too long, but I want to end it on by acknowledging somewhat of a of an, something that I've been sort of tiptoeing around for as much of the joy that I've been able to locate in sort of these songs and, and lamenting sort of how they've been, they, they're sort of relegated to this other place in the Armenian musical narrative. There's sort of this missing element here and that is the women. And I think about my grandma. These were obviously very male dominated spaces or, or created, by, created by men. And in these pictures, my beautiful, beautiful grandma here, she's working in the store in the background. Here in the other picture, she's carrying my mother. And so I wanted to also acknowledge that this joy, somebody was making this joy possible so that the men could go out and make music. Somebody was home watching the children. Somebody was home cooking the food. Somebody was home just creating a home, allowing the survival to, to occur. And so um, my grandmother, Angel, who um, who I who I died when I was a baby. I I also look for her too in these. I see my grandpa with his beret and his beauty and his charisma, and then I see my grandma just working and making life possible. And um, I just wanted to honor her in this narrative as well because there's a place for her too. And I hope we can we can do more about that. So I'm going to end now with a song by uh, performed by Richard Hakopian and Buddy Sarkisian, and I wanted to end it because of the lyrics. So it's Sude Sude. I drink ori, I eat meze. In this world, I have my fun. Don't be deceived by words. Don't believe in love. In this world, everything's a lie. Lie, lie, lie. Everything's a lie. Just one thing you must be, you must believe, eat, drink, and have fun. Because if Armenians have done anything in this, these narratives of trauma, these narratives of victimization, they have always managed to eat, to drink, and to have fun. <laughs> OK, 
Okay, so thank you to everybody um, who stuck around. I'm, I'm very grateful that you are all here. <laughs> yes, uh, I, as I uh, uh, wrote to everybody in the chat, but I'll say also now verbally because maybe not everybody's looking at the chat. Uh, if you have questions for Professor Alajaji or comments that you wanna make, please just uh, type them into the chat box and uh, uh, Professor Khorotunian and I will read them out, and uh, uh, Professor Ali Jaji will be happy to respond, I'm sure. And while I'm uh, waiting for people to do their typing, uh, can I ask, um, I'll, I'll take the liberty of asking a question myself, which is, um, do what, are you, I mean, obviously you're covering a huge waterfront here in the sense you're, you're looking at um, uh, people, you know, the diaspora in the Levant and in the North America. Um, are, uh, has your research allowed you to come into contact with Armenians in Iran at all or? In so, the yeah, so that's, thank you very much for reminding me because I always, always, and I can't believe I forgot to do it this time. I always start with a caveat because one of the one of the things that comes up because the diaspora is so incredibly heterogeneous there's always you know i didn't even cover like you know uh, i barely covered like a fingernails worth of what the, of the musics that exist and so yeah so what's interesting about the armenians from iran so i in my ethnography i have not um i i was very sort of specific in what i was looking at obviously i was looking at like california and beirut um mainly because of like the communication and um intercommunication between the two and so um yeah but what's interesting about armenians from iran is because iran has its own massive pop scene and so so it's interesting how armenians especially those who are of you know enormous musical talent have really been able to sort of become a part of that scene and um and not that they haven't contributed to i i hate sort of you know categorizing things this way not that they haven't contributed to like quote unquote armenian music but that iranian pop scene has really given a, an incredible opportunity to a number of armenian uh, iranian armenian artists I um, if I'll follow up on that slightly and 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 sort of say I had a student who who wrote uh, something very interesting some years ago about um, Kurdish musical traditions, uh, you know, across various borders. And one of the things that turned out to be significant um, in that community, and for a variety of reasons that I think are different from the Armenian circumstance, uh, was uh, the that the um, in the Soviet period the Soviet broadcasters uh, were were produce you know were putting on the air a lot of uh, Kurdish music and so called whatever whatever we mean by the term traditional Kurdish music yeah. uh, uh, and making that available uh, in you know in Turkey and in the Levant and in Iran and in countries where maybe it wasn't so. Um, welcomed yeah. uh, uh, and uh, and that was kind of an important um, uh, linkage to the past I guess and is mm -hmm. there anything similar like that um, in in the work that you do you find anything similar like that in the work that you do like in terms of it like the the role the radio played or? but in the role that the radio played and maybe particularly in the role that Soviet radio might have played I don't know oh yeah that's a really good question so actually Part of the so so this narrative that I'm talking about that that sort of exists that that sort of more cohesive narrative a lot of that is due to the Soviets um, because as we know um, you know the Soviet the Soviets really put in a lot of um, energy to like preserving the folk music of the various Soviet republics and so there was an immense amount of research that came from Armenian scholars. Um, during the Soviet era. And so we do actually have a lot written about sort of like folk, Armenian folk music um, because of that Soviet era. And there's like, a, there's a bibliography of Armenian music that was compiled, um, uh, sorry, of Armenian music research that was compiled. I think it's been maybe 20 years now or 15 years now. And it's remarkable if you go through the bibliography, the dates correlate to the SSR, to the height of the SSR. And so, you know, for whatever my, people might think about, you know, the, the years under the Soviet regime, it really did contribute a significant amount to sort of the, this body of knowledge that I'm talking about in terms of Armenian music. 
Interesting. Thank you so much for that. Well, we have a question from the audience here uh, from uh, Maral uh, Poladian, which I hope I'm saying correctly. And it says, hello, professor. Thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. My question, in the times of Adis and Manuel, did you come across any female singers during those years? Currently, there are many female Ar Armenian pop singers. Yes, no, I did not. And if anybody knows of others, please, please tell me. So yeah, there are a lot of Armenian pop, folk, pop singers now, especially like from the country of Armenia. But um, at the time, like in Beirut and, you know, again, I would love to be corrected, but in Boros's book and in the research and the conversations that I've had, I could not find an Armenian pop musician. However, that being said, Arm Armenian women are, are, you know, are very active, but you see them mainly in like the folk realm, which really makes a lot of sense. Like they're sort of the preservers of the folk music. And so you would see a lot of Armenian, Armenian women performing the folk music and, um, you know, in the piano and playing piano and that sort of thing. But in terms of the pop sphere, it was a very, it was a very, very male uh, gendered space. Uh, do we, um... Uh, I, I okay, here we have another. Can you see them? I think yeah. so, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, let me, I'll just read out. We have another question here. It says, what a beautiful talk, both lyrical and profound. Thank you. I am interested in contemporary music in Armenia today and the ways in which it resonates with the complex continuities and dissonances you so expertly explored in the diaspora, past and present. Uh, and... Um, I think that's that seems to be it. Um, so, yeah, that's a, a comment on that. Yeah, that's a wonderful question and something that I've been thinking about a lot. There are a number of really wonderful, you know, again, one thing that's hard with this is I'll say Armenian bands, but, you know, I don't know quite what that means other, other than them being populated by Armenians. Um, and so obviously I'm an overthinker and so I'm not quite sure what to do with the designation like that. But there's bands like, for example, Collective, Collective Meds Bazaar, who is absolutely amazing. Um, there, and of course, like when I'm on the spot, I can't think of the bands that I want to mention, but there are so many Armenian musicians who are doing remarkable things, especially, 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 especially in Turkey. And, um, and so I would really encourage people to, to, to look at what's going on in Turkey right now and the amazing, amazing sort of musical conversations that are, that are emerging there. It's really quite stunning and quite beautiful. And, um, and I don't mean that in sort of a like you know sort of Pollyanna-ish like oh look they're coming together kind of way but but the way they're 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 envisioning you know folk music from the from Anatolia together I think is really really powerful um, so yes yeah, so there are a lot of people right now who are reimagining Armenian folk music there are of course amazing you know classical musicians but there are also people sort of in the more popular sphere and one of the work, the work that I'm doing now is like the May 6th event, looking at an Armenian futurism. So people who are sort of thinking about an Armenian future uh, through sound. And so there's this amazing sound artist, Lara Sarkisian, who I'm going to be writing about. Um, she's an electronic music artist. And so there are really people who are doing fascinating things. And the truth is they've always been doing fascinating things. Like these, the Armenians have been working in, in, in amazing, you know, really, really thoughtful ways with music, but you don't often hear about it. You'll hear about it, you know, not as part of an Armenian musical narrative. You'll hear about it sort of in other realms or in other dimensions. And so I don't know if it's possible to sort of create a world where we can talk about all of these at once and not sort of relegate them to other discursive frames. But yeah, there's a lot that's happening right now, um, more than one would, I think one would realize, yeah. Can I invite uh, additional questions from the audience? I have one here. We might be looking at different things, but somebody ah. um, asked me what I hope is a fun question. What Armenian song under the broader understanding brings you the most joy? Oh boy, I, I really, I, I did this to myself because I kept talking about it. <laughs> um, gosh, I, you know, it's, it's so, I mean, look, so much of it is tied, as I was saying, like to those moments in the car when you're sort of held captive by your parents and forced to listen to their music and you, 
you know, you sort of roll your eyes and complain on the outside, but on the inside, you're just, you feel so at home. And so like, how can I not, as soon as I hear Karun Karun, like, how can I not smile? Like, you know, or any Adi song, like Nune Nune. Um, there's this song that one time I was interviewing Richard Hakopian and, and there was this song that I remembered my dad singing. And, and this is so Richard because he's a genius and I'm, a, I have a horrible voice. And I said, you know, Richard, there's this song that I'm really trying to figure out like what it was. And he just was like, oh, this, and like he, on his oud, like, and he just did it. And I was like, my God, you know? <laughs> and, um, and so I'm trying to remember now what that song was that meant so much to me. It was, um, yegur um, and so maybe some of you, some of you know this. So, so yeah, so it's, so what brings me joy. And I think like, you know, this is very much tied to like what Armenians are going through right now. But, but, you know, and again, this is so not intellectual or smart, but like, I just look for my grandpa's smile. I look for when my parents were happy and, and I see music as such a part of that. So those memories that this music brings to me, that's, I think that's what brings me the joy. Um. I will go forward here and say that we have a, com a comment, actually, more, more so than a question, but just to share with everybody. Uh, thanking you for a wonderful presentation on what, a, a topic that uh, our co uh, commentator describes as pot potentially more complex than the Armenians themselves. Uh, <laughs> but he says that you should know that a gentleman in Baltimore has rediscovered a female Armenian singer from 1917, 1920s here in the United States, and her name is Zabel Panosyan, yeah. um, and I'm trying to see the end of the comment here, and I can't quite. But um, yeah, Z I know all about Zabel Panosyan. Yeah, so he, he's talking about Ian Nagoski, who has um, oh, what's the yeah, Canary Records? I believe is his. Um, I believe there's somebody in the audience who's nodding, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate you. <laughs> that helps so much because I can't. My brain is not quite working. Um, so Ian Nagoski and also Harry Kazelian, I believe, has been working with Ian Nagoski, trying to learn more about Zabel Panosian. And if there's, I think there's a third person, and if I've missed it, I, I, I sincerely apologize. But Zabel, so what I love about that Zabel recording that Ian Nagoski put on his on his album is so there's this song that's very important to Armenians called Gurung, and Gurung is it's the crane, and in this song, the the singer is asking the crane for news from the homeland saying you know please go home and 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 bring you know bring me news and um and so it's a very very heart-wrenching song and what's interesting about it is it's been covered i mean there so gomidas does have a version of it but the version that zabel is singing is not you know like the most famous version of it is the one that Isabel Bayraktarian sings and she won a Grammy and, and all of this and so it's like some it's an opera you know it's, it's an aria like you can hear it in any concert hall but the one Zabel is singing who was also trained as an opera singer the the lineage of that is not as certain and I believe Harry and Ian are working on trying to figure out where that came from and um, and so I'm very much looking forward to what they come up with and sort of trying to track down the story of Zabel. So yeah, so she is a female singer, but again, sort of like what I was saying, like you did see women music performers in the classical and in the folk realms, but not necessarily in the. Although there was Sugar Mary Bartanyan, who was one of the um, one of the biggest Armenian female singers um, in like the 30s and the 40s, and you know, like in the earlier. Um, in the earlier eras and so so yeah there were women so I don't want to and that's why I hesitate to speak and at all definitively because you know there are probably things that just have not come to my attention and so I, I you know definitely take on the the blame for that but yeah Zabel Panosian maybe those of you who are interested please go listen to the version it's an absolutely like ch chilling like goosebump raising version of Gurung that is is truly phenomenal um, okay, now at the present time, I don't see any new uh, information in my chat box, but I'm wondering, um, oh wait, here comes something. Uh, it says, thank you very much for an engaging talk regarding Armenians in the Iranian popular music scene, scene Vigrin Dardian was a leading early figure in Iranian pop 
and from 1955 in film music, where he was first featured by uh, an Armenian Iranian director, Samuel. And then for some reason, my screen is stuck. Can you see it, Sylvia? Yes, I can. Um, first featured by Armenian Iranian director, Samuel Khachikyan. Um, after now hearing Karun Karun, I believe one of his Persian songs, Barun Barun, I'm assuming uh, may have been based on, inspired by it. What other Armenian songs were reproduced, rewritten with lyrics in other diaspora languages? Um, that's a great question. And I actually, I thought I had found most of the various covers of Karun Karun. So I'm gonna to have to look into this. Um, I, and I would not be surprised if given the sort of global reach of Karun Karun, if this was indeed um, a cover of it. So I'm very, very happy to hear about it. So thank you. Um, what other Armenian songs were reproduced or rewritten with lyrics in other diaspora languages? Uh, that's a really good question. And one that I think most of mostly what would happen is the songs would be translated into Armenian like that that's sort of the language in which everything would would land and so like so we would have you know Arabic songs or Armenian songs or, or Turkish songs and in order to make them playable for the Armenian communities or passable for the Armenian communities they would be translated into Armenian and but more specifically into Western Armenian especially for like the diaspora and so so yeah so it was it's I I think, I mean, maybe more, I think the Kef bands did this a little bit more for, because they were playing mainly for American Armenians, where they might have translated some of the lyrics to like English, for example, especially as the generations went on and, and, and fewer and fewer people spoke Armenian. So, so you might have seen sort of that directional uh, kind of translation, but as far as like the Beirut Armenians go, the whole point was to make sure like the Armenian language was, was, was actively being spoken and sung. And so those are the songs that they would, whatever they were taking, it would, it would sort of be filtered into, into Armenian. But I, I hope that answered your question a little bit, but it's something that I'm going to have to think a little bit more about. Um, we have a further question from uh, Kavor Kagopian asking, you know, saying there's a big Armenian community in India. And yeah. um, uh, do you do you have information or have you come across any musical tradition from that community? So, no. I, yes, there is. So, yeah. Yes, there is. And thank you so much for bringing this up, because there's not only an, an Armenian community in India, but there's an Armenian community in Ethiopia. And um, just to mention two places, I mean, you know, Armenians always say there's Armenians are everywhere, you know, and so Ethiopia and India, though, are very interesting because uh, specifically for the musical traditions that that emerge there from the Armenian communities. And I believe there is actually a documentary that somebody made or wrote something on on Ethiopian Armenian musicians and their contributions to like Ethiopian jazz. I believe it was by Norik again, I'm going to be humiliated by Nordic de lunch. I, I'm so sorry, look it up because it's it's really, really fascinating. And so so I have to say that in my own work, I haven't spent a lot of time studying it myself, just, you know, just sort of appreciating and knowing that that it's out there and there are amazing people who are looking into it. But thank you to whoever asked the question because indeed, um, uh, there are Armenian communities so far spread. And, and that's sort of, again, the, the point that, you know, I, I want to come back to, like wherever Armenians were, they ended up creating a music, just like many diaspora groups did, or, you know, groups in exile, that they made a, a music that was very much of the time, that was very much present, you know. And, um, and the fact that, you know, that they're not a sort of a, a part of the standard sort of narrative, I think is, you know, what's, what's interesting. All right, I am going to take this pause to to uh, say that while this has been thoroughly engaging, we should take pity on our poor speaker who's been- <laughs> I take pity on you. <laughs> uh, uh, in the hot seat for an hour and a half, you know, uh, and um, thank her kindly for what has been a wonderful evening and a fascinating talk. And I also do want to take this opportunity to remind everybody that we have a second upcoming Dumanian event on May the 6th, which will uh, be a panel discussion featuring um, a, our artist and filmmaker and writer uh, Kami Abrahamian with two uh, commentators um, uh, 
uh, speaking, uh, engaging with uh, this person about their work. Uh, and so on that note, let me bid you all a good night and please join me in uh, thanking Professor Ali Jaji for this wonderful talk. Thank you all. Bye. Night. Little by little. All right, I'm going to I'm going to disconnect, folks. Uh, everybody have a nice evening, and uh, we'll hope say, to see you on May. Can I just say real quick? Um, can I just say real quick, Frank? It's nice to meet you. I haven't seen you yet. <laughs> I I we uh, I were in person, and we could have sat and had coffee. But... Yeah, I know, I know. Yeah, oh, that could, that day is coming. Uh, yeah. That day is coming. <laughs> we could have also had some wine toast uh, as yeah. usual. Normally, we everybody who's still in the room. Normally, we have a reception. After Please come this. next year. <laughs> we'll have a reception again. Uh, you can come back, Sylvia, and have a reception. <laughs> Please, yes, I would love that. I would love that. I see. Is that Mrs. Dumanyan? I saw you dancing, and I I was really grateful because I was dancing with you. <laughs> uh, so anyway, that's uh, that's the way it was this evening, but. Um, we're really excited about the panel discussion upcoming as well. Yeah, so I'm, I'm really, fabulous. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it too. I think a lot of my a lot of colleagues are seeing this as sort of an an, uh, uh, an opening discussion on introducing the concept of Armenian futurism to yeah. the discourse. So yeah, well, that's wonderful. I mean, so it'll really be an opportunity to to start to make a space for something. Then that's great. Ex that's exactly the intention. Yeah, and we actually already got um, the me and one of the speakers um, are going to be guest editing uh, the Journal of Armenian Studies um, journal and we're dedicating it to this to this question of futurism in, in Armenian studies. So so I think it'll be, we'll, 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 it'll always be tied to the Dumanyan um, lecture. <laughs> yes. yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's okay. fantastic. It is. It is. Well, fantastic. thank you again, Sylvia. Yeah. I, I hope that was, I think that was okay. Presentation. Yeah. That was fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, we're thrilled. Uh, <laughs> so great. I'm gonna I'm gonna press the end button because somebody has to do it. Yes. Uh, okay. <laughs> and, uh, uh, I'll, I'll talk. Bye. I'll talk to you soon. We'll make a date to get together soon. Sounds good. Okay. Right. okay. Take Bye. care, everyone. Bye, Sylvia. Thank you.